So after digestion of carbohydrates, we now must absorb the monosaccharides. This video will describe what we know about carbohydrate absorption. We're going to talk about the difference between passive and active transporters, describing the advantages of each. Second, we're going to describe how monosaccharides are absorbed from our lumen of our gut into our blood. And then finally, we're going to talk about the consequences if this absorption is not efficiently done. There are two major types of transporters, passive transporters and active transporters. Passive transporters do not require energy of any type. They are entirely dependent on a concentration gradient. That means the direction of transport depends on what is the concentration on one side of the membrane and what is the concentration on the other side of the membrane. As that concentration gradient diminishes, there'll be less transport. The other type of transporters are known as active transporters. These require energy. This could be provided by a chemical gradient or ATP. This means that these transporters can function independent of the concentration gradient of the thing being transported. This is important if you're trying to concentrate or suck in a particular nutrient from one place to another. For example, if you're trying to absorb all the sugars out of your gastrointestinal tract into your body, active transport would be more effective as the concentration decreases. In terms of monosaccharide transporters, there are six major transporters that are important. GLUT1, GLUT2, GLUT4, and GLUT5. These are all passive transporters with different specificity and different tissue expressions. And SGLT1 and SGLT2. These are sodium glucose co-transporters that exist either in the intestine or the kidney. So let's talk about what happens after a sugar is digested and is ready to be absorbed. There's actually two concentration gradients we have to consider. One is the gradient between the gastrointestinal lumen and the enterocyte. The second concentration gradient we need to consider is the gradient between the enterocyte and the blood vessel. Therefore, for a sugar to be transported from the lumen into the blood, it has to pass through two transporters, one on the apical side of the enterocyte and one on the basal lateral side of the enterocyte. So let's take the first example, where there are very high levels of a particular carbohydrate, maybe after a large carbohydrate-rich meal. There's now a high gradient between the gut lumen, which has the digested carbohydrates, and the enterocyte. This allows for the passive transporter GLUT2 to transduce the sugar from the lumen into the enterocyte. As sugar is transported into the enterocyte, there's now a high gradient between the enterocyte and the blood vessel. That means that GLUT2 on the basal lateral side of the enterocyte can transduce sugar from the enterocyte into the blood vessel. This is now totally dependent on passive transport and therefore is dependent on high levels of those sugars in the lumen relative to the enterocyte and then relative to the blood vessel. This would be true after a large carbohydrate rich meal. What happens after absorption occurs? Now concentrations are lower in the lumen, however there are still some sugars present. In this case, it might be advantageous for us to absorb more sugar than that passive gradient would allow. This is where SGLT1 comes in. This is a sodium glucose transporter. It is driven by a sodium gradient, which is created by a sodium potassium ATPase. Glucose or galactose are co-transported with sodium in this active transport mechanism and are therefore concentrated within the enterocyte. This can occur even when there are very low levels of glucose and galactose in the lumen. This concentration results in a high level of sugar in the enterocyte and a relatively low level in the blood vessel. Passive transport via GLUT2 can be used to traffic from the enterocyte across the basal lateral membrane into the blood. This can be passive transport because there's a high level of solute within the enterocyte. You may notice that SGLT1 works on glucose and galactose, but fructose is not shown. SGLT1 has very low affinity for fructose. So what happens with fructose at low levels? There's a high affinity transporter, a passive transporter, called GLUT5 that is present on the apical membrane of enterocytes. This means fructose can still be transduced across from the lumen into the enterocyte via GLUT5 and then into the blood via GLUT2. However, because this is still passive transport, there's no concentrating mechanism by which you can suck in more fructose than the gradient would allow. As a result, we have a relatively poor ability to absorb fructose, generally about 60% efficiency relative to glucose and galactose. Again, this is because we have no active transport mechanism to suck fructose into the blood, unlike glucose and galactose. So what would happen if this went wrong? Let's describe a particular condition called glucose-galactose intolerance. This is often caused by loss of function mutations in a particular gene called SLC5A1. This encodes for SGLT1 the active transporter on the apical membrane of the enterocyte. Now this is quite rare. Only about 300 cases of this condition have ever been described worldwide. 
However, it's described because it has life-threatening diarrhea and dehydration in newborns. Take a moment and think, why would this be? And how could you potentially treat this condition? Recall, many newborns have a high level of lactose in their diet. That lactose is broken down into glucose and galactose. SGLT1 is critical for getting the last of the glucose and galactose out of the lumen and into the enterocyte. If you do not have activity of SGLT1, that glucose and galactose will stay in the lumen and traffic into the large intestine. As solutes appear in the large intestine, it can draw in water, resulting in diarrhea. High levels of diarrhea can result in dehydration due to excretion of water. In patients with glucose-galactose malabsorption, the consumption of lactose, or glucose and galactose, can result in diarrhea, which can be life-threatening in those newborns. Those newborns should be identified very early in life and prevented from consuming lactose. In summary, there are several transport processes that are important for digestion and absorption. These can be active, or these can be passive transporters. The difference of which is dependent on whether or not energy is required and there's a need to concentrate a particular sugar into our bodies. Carbohydrate absorption occurs under both high and low luminal concentrations of sugar and has different mechanisms for each. The mechanisms could involve both active and passive transport, the need for which depends on the luminal concentration. Fructose, because it does not have active transport mechanisms, is generally poorly absorbed and can cause gastrointestinal distress if large amounts are consumed and those sugars end up in the large intestine. There are rare loss of function mutations in SGLT, and that results in glucose and galactose malabsorption, not due to an inability to digest those sugars, but an inability to concentrate those sugars out of the lumen and into our bodies.